Welcome to another episode of Your Hope-Filled Perspective, where it's always our goal to restore hope, renew minds, and empower listeners to live in their God-given identity. I'm so glad you decided to spend a few minutes of your week with us today. Today, we're going to be talking about how we can find joy despite some of life's most heartbreaking situations. In fact, my guest today is going to help us understand how joy can be found in any situation. Today's leading scripture verse is Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song, I praise him. Today's guest is Adria Wilkins. Adria enjoys telling a story, adding sprinkles of joy and a few extra dollops to liven it up. But after suffering the unthinkable death of her three-year-old son, Blake, she found that Jesus sustains and even surprises his followers with joy. Adria has an accounting degree from Western Kentucky University, and she and her husband, Eric, live in Northern Virginia and have three children, Katie, Blake, and Anthony. Welcome to the program, Adria. Thank you, Michelle, for having me. Oh, I'm delighted to have you. And I'm excited about today's topic because I think this world needs just a little more joy. How about you? Oh, yes, definitely. Every day we all need it just to get through sometimes. Yeah. Before we go to there, though, let's talk just a little bit. What's it like being a minister's wife? Well, um, an interesting thing is I'm actually a preacher's kid, and my dad's still a pastor of a small church, and um, growing up, you know, I saw inside as a child uh, the home of a family of, of the minister, and it's difficult. And so I wasn't for sure that I really wanted to marry a pastor. I actually uh, told my mom one time, I'm never going to marry a preacher. <laughs> and Be so careful when you say never, right? <laughs> that's exactly what she said. Don't ever say never. <laughs> so when I started dating my husband, my mom said, I thought you said you were never going to marry a pastor. <laughs> and I said, well, he's not. He's going to be a minister of education. <laughs> So that was my answer to that. Oh, so wow. he is actually a minister of education. Um, they now call it the next steps pastor. Um, and so that is what he does. And he is over all the discipling programs, missions, kind of like the associate pastor would be. Mm -hmm. We have um, our church currently uh, runs three services and we have about a thousand in attendance on any given Sunday. So it's a pretty good sized church. But I will tell you this is being a minister's wife. Um, you learn that Sundays is a work day. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. And if you have children, the husband tends to go early to church, sometimes real early, like six or seven in the morning. And you have to get the children ready to go and carry them into church and do all that. So you don't have a spouse that's there helping you get in and get them saddled. And they are out doing their thing of checking on people, Sunday school classes, so forth. So on Sundays, when I walk in, sometimes people will say, have you seen Eric? And I'm like, I haven't seen him since six o'clock this morning. <laughs> and it's 10 o'clock. And then there are days that after church, he has multiple meetings. And so sometimes it is six or seven o'clock at night on Sundays before he gets home. So that is a pretty typical Sunday. So that is okay. Um, we have learned that on Thursday, which is his regular day off, that we do some things family-wise on those days. So uh, it's okay. Uh, and I really wouldn't have it any other way because um, it is a difficult life sometimes, but it is also a joy-filled life that 
when you know that you're doing what God wants you to do, he gives you that joy, even after difficult, hard days or after days of celebration at church. Boy, isn't that the truth. Adria, so often our passion comes out of our own hurts and trials. So I'm curious, what began your pursuit of joy? Or have you always been joyful? Well, when I started to write my book, I asked my mom that question. I said, have I always been kind of joyful or happy uh, feeling and have a pretty positive attitude? And she said, you know, you really have always kind of been that. And I had asked another friend of mine because she lost a child as well. And she always seems like she is upbeat and optimistic. And of course, she's a Christian as well. But I called her last summer and I just said, could you just tell me what you think makes us continue to have joy even after the loss of a child or any other difficult situation? And she said, well, you know, Adria, I have found that I've been a pretty I look at the positive side of things, but she said, I really, the only answer I can give you is that my faith in Jesus is what gives me that joy. And that's the only answer I can give you. And she said, I know that that probably sounds like a a pan answer. And I said, well, that's all I could come up with. And I even asked my husband the same question. And he said, and I told him, I said, how did we stay positive even during the three years of tough stuff with our child and he his answer was I don't want it to sound like it's just another bad answer but he said it was our faith and our trust in God and so I said okay that is the answer Um, but I have always kind of taken the perspective of trying to find joy in any situation, no matter what it is. Tell us a little bit about those three years with Blake and what that was like so that our listeners get a sense for what was it that you were still really contending with while you were fighting to keep your joy? Right. So in 1999, our son Blake was born Um, We had no idea that he was going to have any medical problems. Nothing ever showed that there was. And when he was born, um, actually, I had gone in for a stress test, and they couldn't find a heartbeat. So they took me over to the, told me to go over to the hospital, and I did. And the doctor came in, and he was like, we're having a baby right now. So I did have an emergency C-section. And whenever I woke up from that, I heard my husband sniffling and I asked him what was wrong, and he said, well, our son was born with spina bifida, and so I I thought, well, you know, I've heard of that, but I really don't know what that is, or couldn't think of it, because I was still under anesthesia, so he said, um, well, his spine is open about three inches, and um, they're going to have to care flight him to Dallas. We were in Paris, Texas at the time, so Dallas was two hours away, and close that, the spine up so that it wouldn't get infected. So they wheeled him in, I got a glimpse of him, and they they care flighted him to Dallas. So here I am in the hospital in Paris, Texas with a five-year-old child and then a newborn baby. And I have no family in town, all of our families in Kentucky. My husband goes on to Dallas, so I am now in the hospital, split wide open (laughs) from emergency uh, surgery. And so my husband told one of the ladies at church, you're going to have to take care of Adria while I'm gone. So she did. She ended up mentoring me and nurturing me. And her name is Glenna Ford and fantastic lady. And um, she helped me through the many days ahead um, and got me home and settled. And then four or five days later, I was able to go and see my son for the first time. And I often tell people that I saw my child uh, and heard stories through a Polaroid picture. Uh, Back in 99, we really didn't have cell phones (laughs) and there were Polaroid cameras. So somebody from our church bought a Polaroid camera. And every time somebody from church would go visit Eric, 
they would bring back pictures for me to see in the hospital and they would tell stories of what they saw. And so I learned about my child through people at our church for the first four days. So, you know, we relied heavily on our church during that time as well. And they nurtured us during that time in Paris, Texas at First Baptist Church. But Blake ended up with a lot of other medical problems. He had Arnold Chiari malformation, which is the brainstem area that controls your breathing, swallowing, and body temperature. And his was injured in utero somehow. The nerves were damaged. So he could not breathe on his own. He could not, like we don't have to think about breathing but he could not do it on his own. So he had to be on a ventilator, which we all are hearing about ventilators these days. So we know very much about those. He had to be on a ventilator 24 hours a day. And we had home health care in our home for three years. And it felt like our home was a revolving door of home health care, respiratory therapist, uh, physical therapist, equipment people. Um, But you know, sometimes whenever I tell people about Blake's situation, they, in their mind, they paint this grim picture. But Blake was alive and well, and he could move from his waist up. He could sign, we taught him 15 sign language words. Um, He could play and throw toys and make a mess, just like every other child. He just had to be in a sitting frame, a corner chair to help him set up, or a standing wheelchair to play. And so he had his unique challenges, but we tried to make his life as normal as possible. And he was actually getting ready to go to school. They were going to take him on the bus at three years old, which kind of scared me to death. <laughs> but um, what, what I, um, we actually were preparing for all of that. And one day my husband and I were at work. We came home and there was an ambulance at our house and the nurse was there and the trach had come out and she couldn't get it back in. And so he basically died of an accident of, of suffocation, but they were able to get his breathing started back with a ventilator. Um, and, but he was brain dead at that point because he had gone too long for about five minutes without air. Mm-hmm. So we decided three days later to let him go And it was a beautiful experience. I thought it would be really difficult. Um, And it was in its own way. But, you know, I've had people that said, you know, you all seem to be doing well after three years, you know, and and when he passed. And I said, you know what? We grieved from day one Mm -hmm. for his life. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to leave you there and and we can continue on with your next questions. But I wanted to at least kind of give you a, a little pretty good picture there uh, in summary form. You know, having worked with so many families, I know that the death of the child is one of the biggest stressors a marriage can go through. But it sounds to me like you and Eric were so grounded in your faith, both individually and together as a couple. I know there still had to be difficult days, but is that what you attribute basically your sustaining power to is having that faith? Because I know many couples don't survive. Their marriage doesn't survive after the loss of a child. Yes, you're exactly right. Um, The percentage of people that get a divorce when they have a special needs child is very high. Um, And that was one of our goals that we would stay and fight, you know, and and my husband and I have always had a really good, we've never really, we have little arguments, probably more so now than what we do. we did a long time ago but it's usually petty stuff but we have always our attitudes are are very positive and so we tend to my actually my husband probably helps me have a a little bit different perspective when I kind of get disgruntled about something but he'll bring me around and give me that different perspective which always helps but yes communication I have told many parents of special needs children I have said to them, if you don't do anything else, communicate. Mm -hmm. Communicate is the key. 
you have to talk this out. You have to say, this is what we're going to do today in this situation. You talk it out and say, well, what do you think about this? If you're in the hospital, what do you think about this situation? Talk it out, hash it out. You can't be a one-sided, you can't let mom take care of the child all the time. The dad has to get in there and get his hands dirty. And that's one of the things my husband did. He actually <clears throat> learned all the medical terminology. He could talk with the doctors <laughs> as if he was a doctor. And the doctors had often told him, and even at the end said, you're basically an MD, you know, even though you don't have the degree because he knows and he can still rattle off all the terminology. And I would just say, give me the cliff notes. That's all <laughs> I want. <laughs> You know, what are we looking at? Um, and so I would say it is vital. And faith is the other. I talked to a mother last November who has a special needs child that's an adult. And I asked her the same question. How did you all stay together? And she said, our faith. That and just communicating. Those are the two basic keys, I do believe, that get you through and people that do not have Jesus, it, it is difficult. And I've, I've walked with a family in our neighborhood that has lost a child last year. And it, it was hard because they, they do not have faith and they're still struggling, but mm -hmm. I have ministered to them and reached out to them the best that I can. And God is continuing to work in that situation. And so um, there's some amazing stories there as well. You know what you're sharing really underscores what I have written about in Breaking Anxiety Script and what I tell people all the time. And that is that you have to know what you believe before the crisis hits. Because when the crisis hits, you don't have time to decide what you're going to believe. You're automatically going to fall back on your core beliefs. And it sounds to me like that's what you and Eric did. You fell back on your faith because yes. you both knew what you believed and that was your sustaining power. But I think yes. too often people wait, you know, they, they don't anticipate what would I do if something like this happened? And, and we all hope that something like this doesn't happen, but the Bible is very clear that we're all going to go through trials. Yes. So you better know what you believe before the trials hit, because that's what's either going to make you or break you when it does hit. Yes. Let's talk for a moment about what is the difference between joy and happiness? Because I think this is really kind of a crucial element for people to understand. How would you answer that? It is very important to understand. Happiness comes and goes. You know, I always tell people, if I were to tell you that you're going to go on um, a Hawaiian vacation, people would get happy. Yay. All right, let's go. Yes, I but, mean, then, <laughs> <laughs> but if I say, but you don't have the money to go, so sorry. Well, then you're disappointed and you're not happy anymore. So it can come and go as quick as it just a blink of an eye. But joy, when you have Jesus in your life, when you have made him a part of your life, and you have a relationship with him, and you believe that he came to our world as a baby through the Virgin Mary. And that right there is a miraculous, unbelievable story too, as well. <laughs> and if you believe that he came and died for us and that he rose again. That's another miracle that that is the beginning and the starting point. Once at nine years old, um, I accepted Jesus as my savior. One night, my dad was upstairs studying and I just was feeling like struggling back and forth. I was like, you know, I've been in church for nine years, hear it all the time, but I've never really made a decision. And so I went upstairs after thinking about it and struggling. And I was like, I need to do this right now. So I went upstairs and talked to my dad and he shared that Jesus came, died for us and rose again. All we have to do is believe. And so I did that night and we prayed. And so that was the beginning of my joy journey, joy journey at age nine. And 
I wanted to share with all my friends. We, I had friends that I played with. We ride bikes, play cards, and I was ready to go share it the next day. And because when you find something like Jesus and the joy of Jesus, you want to share it with everybody. And oftentimes I will be out and about, like I've even been not, I haven't been to the grocery store recently, but I've been in the past <laughs> that I've had people that will say at the register, why are you so happy? You know, cause I'll greet them with a smile, say, how are you today? And one day I had a lady ask me that. And I said, you know what? Because I have Jesus in my life mm. and I've been blessed. And she said, I'm so glad because I believe too. And she said, can I come around and give you a hug? Of course, this was before the days of coronavirus, but <laughs> and this was several years ago. And she did. And she came around and, and gave me a hug. And she said, I really needed to hear that today. And so people can see that you have joy. They can see it in your expressions. They can see it in your tone of your voice. I will tell you about this family that I met down the road and the mom that was, her child was dying any moment. And I went down and introduced myself, never met the family before this. In the dying moment of her child, I met this lady, this mom. And I said, you don't know me but I'm your neighbor up the road. And I just want you to know that I know what you're going through. And if you need anything, I'm here for you. And I gave her my card. Several months later, I got an email from her and it was very heartfelt and a very long email. And she said, and summed it up really well, the day that was the most horrible day of my life your eyes told me that you cared. And I thought, wow, that is beautiful. And I felt like I had done what God wanted me to do, even though at the time I felt like, oh, did I do the right thing? You know, going to a stranger's home where their child is dying. But yet I felt like God wanted me to go. I was driving down the road and he told me to turn around because there were a lot of cars there and I knew something was different. And so you can tell that I'm still emotional about it because it's not been very long, but I do ask God to show me moments that I can reach out to families. Now, not just for people that have lost children. I'm talking about for the loss of a job, for the loss of health, for the loss of expectations. You know, that is one thing I have learned this year, that even before the coronavirus, I was going through some things that I had some expectations about, and they were let down. I was disappointed. And I had to learn to walk through that and say, okay, what has made me disappointed? Why has it made me disappointed? And how can I find the joy during this disappointment? And so I decided that I'm going to have to look at this situation a little different. And it was during the birth of my grandson, my first grandson. And so I had to struggle and learn that I can't be at the hospital with my daughter because they chose that they wanted to be there by themselves. But now there's a lot of people dealing with that. And so my heart understands what people are going through right now, losing someone or someone that's sick in the hospital and they can't go see them, even at the uh, nursing homes. And so God gave me that experience at the first of the year so that I can relate and write about it and tell other people about how I got through it. So that's a long answer to what the difference in joy and happiness is. But there is joy to be found no matter what circumstance you're going through. And yeah, it's going to be hard. I promise you it's going to be hard. But all you have to do is change your perspective sometimes or get somebody else's perspective to be able to see the joy in the situation. I love that. And what you're really talking about 
is what we read about in scripture where it says that God will comfort us so that then we can comfort others with the comfort we've been given and yes. give an example after example of how that has been true. I know without even asking you that you would never ask to go through the loss of a child, but out of it has come ministry opportunities where whether it's just the look in your eye or it's the comment that you speak, you are sharing the love of Jesus. And you might be the only Jesus with skin on that people ever see. And yes. so what a beautiful example of how God never wastes our pain. I want to just let our listeners settle in with that, that God never wastes our pain. Let's go real quickly to a commercial break. But friends, we're going to be right back to hear Adria share more about the pursuit of joy. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your Hope Filled Perspective, where today we are talking with my guest, Adria Wilkins, about the pursuit of joy. Adria, will you share with us what brings you joy? Well, right now, my grandson brings me a lot of joy. He's only three months old, and he is really, really cute. He's got blue eyes and blonde hair, so you can imagine. Oh, yeah. But, you know, just simple things like watching butterflies and birds and the trees blowing in the wind. Um, honestly, I love to just sit out on my front porch and watch nature. It is so active and yeah. vibrant. And one day I went out in my backyard and I decided that I would put a blanket down and I just kind of laid there and all of a sudden, was laying on my stomach and I noticed that there were these little ants crawling and where I had laid down, they had to make, so I actually laid on some ants, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they I'm started sorry, that part would bring me joy, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so here they were and they started going a different route. Well, the next thing I know, there are bumblebees flying around because there are little flowers and they're flying around. So, I wrote a little devotion called Invading Their Territory because I felt like that I had invaded their territory because the activity that was going on down in that ground, I, I had no idea. I don't even, I had to get outside and realize that there is life bursting out here. And honestly, my senses became overloaded that there were birds flying, because I, I guess because I was laying down and they didn't notice I was there. But I, I was stimulated so much in my senses that I had to get up <laughs> because I was afraid that I was going to have these other bugs and critters crawling on me. And so I was like, you know what? I need to leave this, <laughs> leave this down here on the ground. But out of that, I had a devotion that was written and um, talked about that sometimes we invade the territory of others who are living their life and enjoying their life. And sometimes things invade that territory and um, they had to begin to work around that or say, you know, leave us alone. We're going to go ahead and do what we want to do. But um, it was an amazing moment. And so I just love to be out in nature and listen. We go out for walks now in the woods and we hear frogs and birds and ducks and everything else. Um, but we went into this bamboo forest recently, which, we didn't even know it was out there in this, in our neighborhood. It was unbelievable. And there's a video on my Facebook if y'all ever want to check it out. We walked in amongst these bamboos. It was amazing. So I've done a devotion on bamboos and what that's all about. And, you know, they're antibacterial and anti-micro something. <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> what the exact thing is. But they have an amazing story about what all you can do with bamboo and people eat bamboo and build things with bamboo. And so just getting out in nature 
really not only stimulate your senses, and I do some series on our senses and how we can find joy through all of our senses of our eyesight, our smell, the taste. And um, when you sit down and think about your senses and how you can find joy in each one of those, there's a lot that you can really open up the doors uh, to and, and see the joy in and through all of our senses. So I encourage people to get out and experience nature and sit and listen and watch because you will discover that there's a bunch of life out here going on. <laughs> being out in nature is one of the ways that I connect with joy as well. Just being still and, you know, watching the water, listening to all the different bird calls. There's so many different ones. And, yes. and you know, knowing that God cares about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air and to watch that, but then to realize how much more he cares about us. But would you talk for a minute for our listeners about what are some practical ways to look for joy, even when they're in the midst of a crisis? You went through that difficult, painful crisis with Blake being sick and then losing him. Our listeners may not be going through the same type of crisis, but whatever they're going through, what are some practical ways that they can look for joy in the midst of that? Well, when I when our son was first born, I decided to journal and to journal all the amazing things that people were doing to minister to us, bringing us food, so forth and so on. And for three years, people nurturing us. And so I wrote and journaled what we were going through, some of the ugly stuff, some of the joyful things and good things. And I still can look back at that journal and see how God worked. And it did bring, it still brings me joy to look back at those times that, wow, look at all these people that were praying for us. I kept a list of churches around the world that were praying for us and um, people that were praying for us and sent us cards. And so just writing out some of the things that you're going through in the um, experiences, then at the end, you could even ask yourself, okay, I'm going through the loss of a job right now. So what can I do to find joy during this time? There are a lot of people right now that have lost jobs. And we understand that from our own personal level because when we were in Frisco, Texas, several years after our child passed away, we went to a new church. And five years later, 2008 hit and the economy went down. Mm. There were a lot of, of IT people that went to our church. And so our church began to suffer financially. And so our, we were laid off from church, <laughs> from being a minister. And I never thought anything like that would happen. But the day that he came home and told me that we were being laid off, it hit me hard. I literally could not stand up. I had to sit down and I wept most of the evening because I thought I've never even imagined anything like this. Sure. And so when people lose jobs, you know, I lost a job when we moved here. Uh, we, we had a government contract where I was working and a year into it, they lost their contract with the government. So I got laid off. And it didn't affect me as much because first of all, we experienced it the first time. But we were able, when we got laid off in the ministry, yes, it was painful. But once we discovered, okay, this is God's plan for us. It's going to be okay. We're going to make it through this. And, you know, whenever you are interviewing with the church, they often call it like a dating process. You have to go and meet and decide if you like them. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say it like that? Or if you feel like God is calling you there. So, you know, about six months later, we found uh, that God wanted us to be up here in Woodbridge, Virginia, 25 minutes from D.C. Who would have thought? We never thought. I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> I'm a country girl. I'm not That's supposed to be <laughs> I'm not supposed to be up in a big city called D.C. Never had been here, but was amazed. And as soon as we got here, we were like, 
this is where we're supposed to be. Wow. And I'm going to tell you what, it was hard moving up here. First of all, our son was married in Texas. We moved to Virginia. It's about 14 hours away. So I knew that we probably would not go back maybe once or twice more in our lifetimes to his gravesite, but he's not there and that's okay. And so I cried most of the way that we drove here that when our move, but also the first three years here was very difficult. It's a culture shock living here. Sure. And it's a whole nother podcast about what living a life up here is like. It is very difficult. There are so many different people up here. So many personalities, so many people that are stressed. So I had to learn to find joy in these hard three years. Now we've been here almost 10 years. And once you get established and make friends and settle into your new place, whatever job it is, then you will find joy again. And it might be that, you know, it's not going to come instantly as far as once you find out, oh, I've lost a job or, you know, now I'm sick and I have this illness. It's going to be hard for a while. But once you get through that, if you will journal and write down and maybe ask yourself some questions, what joy can I find in this? Um, One of the things that in my book, I offer are some questions for people after they have read through the devotion and journaled. And I have had people that have said to me, I went through a difficult divorce. I never thought there was anything joyful in that. But now years later, when I'm reading this and the questions that you're asking me, I've been able to find joy through that. I've had several people tell me that. I've had a man that told me that. And he wept as he told me. He said, I never thought there would be joy there. And so there is joy to be found. We just have to be on the lookout for it. And that's kind of my motto is be on the lookout for joy. And so you got to look, you got to write, you got to read, you've got to sit out in nature and, and, and look for joy. Because I always say, tell people, are you breathing right now? That's something to be joyful about. So if you start there, the rest of it, there's a lot. <laughs> what you're saying, Adria, reminds me of in Breaking Anxiety's Grip, where I talk about one of the factors to increase our trust is turned to the testimony of previous experiences. And what you're saying by by journaling, what you're seeing and what you're experiencing that brings joy, you're documenting so that in the future, you can look back and say, I did have joy then. God did provide it. You know, it makes me think of the verse, though weeping may last for the night, my joy comes in the morning. Yes. Your book, The Joy Box Journal, is a little bit different than most, though, because it actually includes an actual joy box, right? Tell us about that and how you intended the reader to use that, because I just think that's ingenious. (laughs) Well, here's, you can see this, and for those that are listening, it says The Joy Box Journal, but inside the front cover, there is a box, and it's kind of like a match box but a little bit bigger and um there's the the top cover and then the bottom that you put together easy instructions and there are 40 devotions in the book and at the end of each devotion there are some questions and um they will be related to the devotion and so i have you journal there's plenty of uh journaling pages there and then there's also a question at the end of Uh, the each journal each devotion and um, it is a joy box note and the question might be what animal brings you joy and why at the very back of the book there are six little notepads and I ask you to write yeah they're little note notepads they're they're so cute (laughs) and each one has a little saying like joy noted or joy is, and so you can pick whichever one you want. And so like, if I ask you what animal brings you joy and why, you write that on your little note, 
you put that in the box. Now the box will be now outside of your book because you put it together and you put your note in your book, in your box, sorry. And for years to come, your great, 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 great grandchildren will be able to know what brought you joy. And it's a treasure. It is a treasure. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. It's awesome. I, I love, first of all, that you help the reader take actionable steps to recognize that there is joy around us to be found, but we've got to be willing to look for it. And I love that your questions cause the reader to reflect, to figure out where is joy? What if I maybe not been appreciating all along, but then I, (laughs) those little post-it notes are just so joyful. So I love those, (laughs) but I love that it's a legacy for our kids. And to take it a step further, those are like conversation starters we could be having at the dinner table to teach our children to appreciate that, yeah, you might have had a bad day, but there were still joy moments, treasures to be found in the day if we would look. Ingenious, Adria. I love it. <laughs> well, um, I will tell you this. You know, when I, um, when I first started to write the book, I wanted to have a box in the book, but I didn't know what it would look like. And so whenever I presented my proposal to the publisher, they, I did not have the book the box idea in there. And so when they came back and said, Hey, we want to do your book. We want to publish it. We want to put a box in there. And I said, Oh, I already brainstormed a bunch of ideas. I'll send those to you. And so that's how this came about. But just like you were saying, like one of the questions here is um, about kind words spoken that a doctor spoke to us when our child was passing away. And one of the things that the doctor told us, he was our pulmonologist and he was very technical and all the technical medical terminology. And when we took our son off of life support, um, this doctor said, um, you know, our, he, first of all, he said, we know where Blake is now. He's not with us anymore because he's brain dead. And so he said, you know, now that I have finished kind of talking to y'all through this, he said, now I'm going to cry. And he turned around and he grabbed a paper towel and he said, our world only knows hate, evil, and war. And he said, but Blake knew love. And if our world had a tenth of the love that Blake had, our world would be a different place. And that's one of those stories that some sometimes really gets me because the moment that he said that everyone in the room had goosebumps the nurse that was sitting outside there when the doctor left she said i've never seen him speak like that before on a personal level and so at the end of this devotion i say write down the last kind word spoken to you and who spoke them. And so that's how practical this little journal is. It's so easy, so practical, but it's really just a stop to make you think about what joyful experience that you have had today or this week. So I wanted to share that little story with you. What a great remembrance. Mm -hmm. I would think just thinking back on that conversation during the days that are still difficult, when, when your heart's especially tender and missing Blake all the more. What a great, joyful remembrance that the Lord has given you. Yes. Friends, we're going to take a real quick one-minute commercial break, but stick with us because when we come back, is going to share with you her hope-filled perspective for finding joy even in the midst of crisis. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective. Today, we've been talking about finding joy, even in the midst of heartache and crisis. Adria, if a listener is really struggling to find joy, or maybe they even wonder if they're joy immune. I was at that place a long time ago where I just, I looked around and everybody else seemed so joyful and I couldn't find the joy. So I started to believe the lie that I was joy immune. 
Mm-hmm. If that is our listener today, what hope-filled perspective would you want to give them? Well, I will tell you that we all are going to go through struggles at some point in our life. It may be the loss of a job, family member, illness, whatever. This coronavirus that so many of us are talking about. It is. It has been a time for our entire world to step back and to get back to the basics. And I really do believe that many people's perspectives have changed during this time. And it's been kind of an interesting thing because one day we were watching our service on the the internet, just like other people are right now, our church service. And I was sitting there and I thought, this seems familiar, but I don't know what it is. And it took me a few minutes and I thought, you know how you have that deja vu or something like that, that you think, oh, wow, what was that? That seems familiar. There were many Sundays when our son was alive that I didn't get to go to church. Mm. And because our nurses may be sick or they didn't come that day or whatever. My husband, because he's a minister, would go on to church and be there all day. I would be home by myself with my child, taking care of a child on a ventilator, also who cannot eat or swallow. And so I had his life in my hands. But during that time, I would watch our church on TV because we had a TV ministry. So I would often find that I had to fuel my tank of church on TV. And then I said, oh, this, because I know, I'm, I realized that it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a happy feeling. <laughs> And I was like, what is this feeling? And I thought, oh, I remember this. So now I know what people are feeling right now, that they're thinking, I want to be at church. I want to be with other people, but we can't. And it is a lonely experience when you deal with that. And so I thought, wow, that's an interesting thing that I need to write about. But the other thing is, is that, you know, when we lost our job as a minister, my husband and I were talking about this and he said, even now, and he said, you know, there are millions of people experience what we experience. And so we can offer the hope that it's going to be okay one day. It's going to be okay. But we're probably going to have to spend all of our savings. We're probably going to have to um, cut back and bear necessities, which most churches are and most people are right now. So you learn, and I really do believe in difficult times, it's almost a reset button. And I'm going to be working on a series called Reset to Joy, Reset to Worship, Reset to whatever, fill in the blank. And so I believe that in our world, we are in a reset mode right now. And we are having to get back to the basics. I see families out walking, playing in the yard. I watched our neighbor playing soccer with their young five-year-old the other day and they were all giggling and laughing because you know some of them were having trouble running around (laughs) and because they hadn't done that in a long time and i sat there and chuckled watching them and i received joy just from watching them and so i love to watch people anyway (laughs) and so um so you know whatever you're going through You just are going to have to stop and say, okay, here's my situation. Write it down. I have had, like I said, I've gone through this this year. What is the truth about what I'm in the midst of right now? Right now, we're in the midst of this virus. We're having to protect ourselves. We're having to have groceries delivered or picked up. We're having to to redo everything we're doing. So how can I find joy? Well, guess what? 
I have found it because I've been able to write some more. I've been learning how to do a podcast myself. So I'm taking this opportunity to grow myself, to learn. And so maybe if you're in a time of uh, maybe a family member's in the hospital or you've lost a job, don't just sit back and say, woe is me. Go ahead and have your moment and, and write that truth out where you're at, but then say, okay, what are some things that I can do today that can help me push out of this, to push through this? And go back to that note every day and say, okay, where have I come to, you know, what have I done today? What about, what did I do yesterday? And it's amazing. You're going to be shocked at where you have come. Even during this um, stay at home order, you would not believe the things that I have accomplished <laughs> and learned. And I just decided I'm not going to sit at home and just watch TV. That is for the birds. <laughs> What you're really telling us, and I love this, is that we have to be intentional in seeing the joy that's around us. Yes. What we focus on will grow. And if we're focused on the negative, then that will grow. And yes. we'll end up grumbling and complaining and whining, which the Lord detests. But if we will focus on the things that he has given us that bring us joy, whether like you said earlier, it's the butterflies and the birds flying around, or it's the fact that we have food on our table. The more we will focus on that, the more we will appreciate all the blessings he's given us. I want to close out today's episode, friend, with Psalm 100, verse 1, and it says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. That's telling us that we've got a mandate to look for it and to thank God for the joy. And the more we do that, I'm convinced, the more we will experience his joy. Andrea, I'm so sorry for your loss of Blake. And my heart goes out to you and your family, but I'm so grateful that through that, God has used you to minister to the hearts of those who have needed it. And I thank you and I honor you for sharing your story and sharing about him with us today. Friends, I know that there have been nuggets throughout today's podcast that have piqued your interest, have tugged at your heart, and have given you a mandate to go out this week and look for the joy that's there. As always, this has been your Hope-Filled Perspective with Dr. Michelle Bankson. Until next time, make it a Hope-Filled Week. <laughs>